want you to take your Bible out with me just for a moment. I think this is very important. What we're doing when we say this together is, is we are positioning ourselves, placing ourselves in right position to hear the Word of God. So take your Bible, hold it high in the air, whether it's in book form or digital form, say this after me. This is my Bible, God's Holy Word. I am what it says I am. I will do what it says for me to do. I place myself under the authority of God's Word. It says I am blessed, <laughs> therefore I am blessed. It says I am an overcomer, therefore I overcome every obstacle, every challenge, and every hindrance through the name above every name, Jesus Christ. I open my heart, I open my mind to receive God's word. I receive this word. And I confess this word in the name of Jesus. Amen. Last Sunday, we spoke on the why of missions. We looked at the crippled man at the pool of Siloam, crippled for 38 years. And his cry was this, we have no one, no one to help me get into the water when the angel stirs the water. Tradition said that every year an angel of the Lord would come and stir the water and the first one to step into the water would receive their healing. 38 years this man is waiting. This man is hoping, but there's no one to help him. This is the why of missions. Today, we're going to talk about the how. The need before the church is great. The task is huge. The call is, is bigger than ourselves. The mandate that he has given the church is to reach the world, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ at home and abroad. The mandate is like the old hymn of the church, rescue the perishing, care for the dying, what we realize is we need the move of God. This is the how, the move of God. Yes, we need strategy. Yes, we need methods. Yes, we need initiatives. Yes, we need resources. All of these things and more are important, but our greatest need is the move of the Holy Spirit, the move of God, straight up revival. We need the presence of God. We need him to shake some things up. We need to break up that fallow ground. We need him to stir our hearts toward the things of God. To stir our hearts toward his heart. Jesus told his disciples to go. And then he said, wait, tarry. Our prayer has been, God, do it again. How can we do the things God has asked us to do? How can we raise the budget, see the lost saved? How do we cultivate a climate and atmosphere for God to raise up pastors and missionaries and youth pastors and worship leaders and entrepreneurs? How can we do this? There's an obscure verse in the book of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 1. And the song of Solomon describing a wedding feast or, or something of this nature. And the bridegroom cries out to the guest. Oh, friends, drink, yea, drink abundantly, oh, beloved. And church, I believe today there is a table prepared with the finest blessings of the Spirit, the finest blessings from the Holy One, the finest blessings of the bridegroom are awaiting, and we, the church, only have to partake. We, the church, only have to drink. Drink abundantly, yes. oh, beloved. 
There is a coming, a time that Isaiah describes in chapter 65, verse 24, where the Lord says, I will answer them before they even call to me. While they are still talking about their needs, I will go ahead and answer their prayers. Aren't you thankful that we serve the God that knows what we're walking through even before we walk through it? Aren't you thankful that we serve a God who is anxious and waiting and and, and willing and and ready to, to answer our prayers even before we utter those prayers to him? God invites us to his table. Turn with me just for a moment to Psalm 81. Psalm 81 verse 10. I think this is a very important verse. Psalm 81 verse 10. For it was I, the Lord your God, who rescued you from the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it with good things. Notice the call to Israel was a call to position herself to receive. To receive what? The good things the Lord had for them. Church, I believe the Lord has good things in store for his church. I believe we, the church, must position ourselves to receive what the Father desires to do. Jesus revealed the heart of God. Jesus himself said these words, fear not little flock. It is my father's good pleasure to give you the things of the kingdom. I hope we'll get that in our spirit today. It is the father's good pleasure to bless you. It is the father's good pleasure to pour his spirit out upon you. It is the father's good pleasure to reign upon you in righteousness. It is the father's good pleasure to work in your life, to work in your marriage, to work in your circumstance. It is the father's good pleasure to fill you with good things. God wants to anoint you, empower you, and fill you with his Holy Spirit. Can somebody give God praise? For our first point, our verse is Ephesians 5, verse 18. Be not drunk with wine wherein in excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. When it comes to the how, we need to be spirit-enabled. Write that phrase, spirit Enabled, filled with the Holy Spirit. What we know about today is God is moving. Reports are coming in from all around the world and the nation. God is moving by his spirit. God is moving through the manifestations of the power of God. Through his anointing and his glory. God is moving through the preaching of his word. People are responding to the word of God. People are being saved and healed. God is moving mightily. There's a verse I preached from a few years ago found in Psalm 65 verse 9. The psalmist said this, you take care of the earth and you water it, making it rich and fertile. The river of God has plenty of water. Oh, get that phrase in your spirit. The river of God has plenty of water. The river of God is never in lack. And the Hebrew word for plenty speaks of more than enough. It speaks of abundance. It speaks of overflow. How many are ready for the overflow of the spirit of God? You're ready for the overflow of what God wants to do in your life. The river of God speaks of his never ending supply. And when I preached on that verse, I I brought out this idea. You have to believe big. The river of God is never in drought, not affected by the changing seasons, the shifting sands of culture, or the change in tides. The river of God is not affected by the things around us. There is always plenty of water. You and I may go through seasons, but God is ever the same. Believe big. 
It's always abounding, flourishing, overflowing, and welling up. In the river of God, there is never a lack, never insufficiency in God, never any deficiency in God. And guess what? God never has a bad day. <laughs> now, that's hard for us to understand because sometimes we have some bad days. Sometimes, sometimes we wake up on the wrong side of the bed. Sometimes you do best just to go back home and get in bed and get up on the other side. You need to change those shoes. They're too tight. Amen. Put on some shoes you're going to relax in. Sometimes we have bad days, but hear me this. God never has a bad day. He will enable you. He will empower you. He will fill you with his spirit. You must believe God for something bigger. And we use this verse in Ecclesiastes 11 verse 1 where it says, Cast thy bread upon the water. You shall find it after many days. To cast your bread is to go all in. To cast your bread is to believe. To cast your bread is not to have plan B or plan C. To cast your bread upon the water and say, Lord, here I am. I give you all of me. Now I'm believing that I'll find it after many days. I believe I'll find what I'm looking after. The problem with us is this. We don't cast our bread upon the water. We hold a little bit back. God is calling you and I to deeper commitment. He is calling you and I to a greater sacrifice. He's calling you and I to a total surrender. But I believe that as we cast our bread upon the water, as we surrender to the Lord, God by his spirit is going to move. God by his spirit is going to bring it back after many days. Going after the presence of God. Cast your bread. Hold nothing back. Do not live on reserve. Live in total commitment. Live in unreserved abandonment. To cast your bread is to live in faith, trusting for more and leaving the results to God. It is the belief that if I pursue God, I will find him. And church, I believe that you and I have married adventure. <laughs> We're living by faith. And we should expect the unexpected. Believe God for an overflow of his strength, of his power, of his goodness, of his mercies, of his faithfulness. People are hungry. That's what I see today. And where there is spiritual hunger, there is always pursuit. Psalm 107 verse 8 says, let them praise the Lord for his great love and for the wonderful things he has done for them. Let them go ahead and praise the Lord because God has done great things. Church, has God been good to you? Has God helped you? Has God blessed you? Has God done good things for you? Bush family, can you testify God's done some good things for you? Church, can you testify God's done some good things for you? Hear me today. We had Kevin Luce drop with a heart attack, massive heart attack, the widow maker. God had a person right there to perform CPR. He's in ICU right now, but within the hour, they're going to take off the breathing tube. He's getting better. He's getting stronger. Hear me today. God's been good to us. I'm believing. I'm trusting. God's been good to us. We have reason to shout. We have reason to sing. We have reason to rejoice. We have reason to be thankful. We have reason to sing. We have reason to dance. We have reason to shout. Somebody tell God he's been good. Somebody go ahead. Declare. <laughs> You're planting seed. You're planting seed. You've got to keep breaking up the fallow ground. He's blessed you yesterday, but he's got something new today. You've got to break up that ground because tomorrow he's going to bring another blessing. Go ahead and believe. Go ahead and trust. Go ahead and shout. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Woo. <laughs> The devil took his best shot at you, and guess what? You're still here. You're still believing. And I know your faith. I know this. Even if it didn't turn out the way you had hoped and believed, you're still going to serve God. 
because you know God's good. You know we're headed to eternity. Ooh. How? How are we going to accomplish the things God's laid out before us? Through the enabling power of the Spirit of God. James chapter 4, verse 8. James, the half-brother of our Lord Jesus Christ, learned this principle, and he wrote, Come close to God, and God will come close to you. Come close to God, and God will come close to you. He will fill you. He will empower you. He will enable you. Let's read the rest of the verse. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts. For your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Notice what James shows us. The coming close to God involves cleansing, purifying, and a consecration. The how of missions or any spiritual matter of great significance is a drawing close to God until he endues us with power from on high. And sometimes, church, what we got to do is come with a heart repentant, a heart confessing, a heart saying, Lord, my life has been divided and it will be divided no longer. I'm going to consecrate everything to you. I'm going to cast my bread upon the water. I'm going to give you my whole heart. I'm going to pursue you with everything because I'm believing you to empower me, to help me, and to fill me with your spirit. Jesus told the disciples after his resurrection, before his ascension, Luke records it in chapter 24 of his gospel, verse 49, and now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my father promised, but stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. When it comes to the how, What we need is to be spirit-enabled. Secondly, we need hearts yielded. Hearts yielded, yielded to the purposes of God. To me, this is so important. It's simple, but it's important. See yourself in God's story. See yourself in God's story. So often we see others in his story. So often we know that God will use aunt so-and-so and and sister and brother so-and-so. But we don't think God wants to use us. I submit to you, yes, he does. God has always used the individual, the man, the woman, even the child. In the Old Testament, we see he used Abraham, David, Esther, Ruth, Deborah, Nehemiah, Peter, John in the New Testament, the little boy with the two fish and five loaves of bread. He used Paul and Aquila and Priscilla. God has always used people much like you and me. Don't write yourself out of God's story. See yourself in the story of God. See yourself as God using you, your gifts, your resources, your life, your story, and his story. Because God wants to empower you to make a difference. We even see he used the poor widow woman. Luke records this in chapter 20, 21 Jesus with his disciples in the area of the temple and people are are bringing their offerings to put in the box and many of the rich people are coming and they're dropping their offerings and there's this little poor widow. She drops two small coins in the box. Jesus looked at his disciples and said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has given more than all the rest of them. 
for they have given a tiny part of their surplus. But she, poor as she is, has given everything she has. What was she doing? She was casting her bread upon the water, trusting in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Church, what God wants is not part of you. He wants all of you. What God wants is not just a compartment of your heart. He wants all of your hearts. Have a heart to be used. Isaiah chapter 6, you see that great vision Isaiah the prophet had. Saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his robe, his train filled the temple, and the heavenly beings were flying around crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord our God. And it's here in that moment that he heard the Lord asking, Whom shall I send? Who will go? Isaiah responded, Here I am, send me. Isaiah said, I am available. I want to challenge you today. Be present. Be present for the Lord to use. See yourself in his story. Which brings us to our last thought. When it comes to the how, when it comes to missions, when it comes to anything, a spiritual endeavor the church does, there's always the practical There's always the practical. And can I tell you the empowerment, God filling you with his spirit will lead you to do the practical. It will lead you to share your faith. It'll lead you to give of your heart, to give of your life, to give of your resources, to give of your time. The empowerment of the Holy Spirit always moves you to do the practical. To give. We'll talk about faith promises in the next few weeks, next couple of weeks. I think there's three areas a person should give in and through. They should give their time. You should serve and be in an outreach team. Be involved in, in making ministry happen. Give it your resources, your tithe, missions, giving to missions, faith promise. But give yourselves. Yeah. Give yourself to be used yeah. and to, to grow. Because I promise you, as you do this, you'll begin to grow in your walk yeah. with God. John, the beloved, wrote in his first epistle, 1 John chapter 3, verse 16, we know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. We understand what real love is. We know what real love is because Jesus led the way. Jesus showed us. Jesus gave up his life for us. This is how we know love because God is love. Jesus gave up his life. Now, he says, so we ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. The sacrifice of Christ demands an action of those who receive. You and I have received because of the sacrifice of Christ. We know love because Jesus gave his life. We know the heart of God. We know the heart of Christ. Now, we, in response to that, should give our life one to the other. Wow. How can we do the things we do? Only by the spirit of the living God empowering us, anointing us, baptizing us, filling us. And only through the practical of giving ourselves, casting our bread. Now, the next verse demonstrates that we're not to be servants to our money, but our money is to be a resource to help others. That very next verse, verse 17, if someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need, but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? There's an equation to love and money tied together. John, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, ties the matter of the heart and money together because it's all about, write this word, sowing. It's all about you and I realizing what God has blessed us with 
It's seed for the next season. It's seed for the next harvest. It's seed for the next breakthrough. You had a blessing today. What are you doing to prepare for the blessing tomorrow? You received the harvest today. What are you doing to plant for the harvest tomorrow? This is important. How? How do we accomplish what God has called us to do? How do we see the budget raised? How do we see uh, the law saved? How do we cultivate a climate and atmosphere for God to raise up pastors and entrepreneurs and missionaries and, and worship leaders? How? We got to come hungry to the house of God. Hungry for the things of God. Hungry for the move of God. Going back to Isaiah's vision when he saw the Lord high and lifted up. The mighty seraphim attending around the throne of God. Isaiah relayed what he saw. He says, their voices shook the temple to its foundation and the entire building was filled with smoke. Isaiah felt unqualified. He felt unworthy. He was, he was aware of his own sinfulness, his own need. He saw this vision of the holiness of God. And he felt unqualified for the task. But immediately it says one of the seraphim flew. Flew to him with the burning coal he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. And he touched my lips with it and said, see, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. Let me tell you what my God does. He qualifies the unqualifieds. He equips the call. He fills the hungry. He satisfies the thirsty. The question is, are we thirsty? The question is, are we hungry? The question is, are we willing to cast our bread upon the water? He has promised if we'll open up our mouth, he'll fill it with good things. He has said, I will come and visit you again. I will pour my spirit out upon your sons and your daughters. Daughters, they will prophesy. They will declare. Church, I believe that we're on the preposition of something huge, something big. Uh, the infilling of the power of the Holy Spirit for the mission of God. Yes. Are you hungry? Finally, write this. Write the word anticipating. I think it's important. We talk about the how. We have to come to the house of God anticipating yes. come expecting Good. expectation is the fertilizer that brings exponential blessings yes. hear me expectation is the fertilizer that brings exponential blessings how did you come to the house of God today yes. looking forward anticipating mm -hmm. believing Trusting God to do something? Or did we come simply out of routine? Simply out of fulfilling an obligation? I know you're here today because you are looking forward to what God wants to do. I read a verse from Psalm 81 earlier, verse 10. It was I, the Lord your God, who rescued you from the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide, and I will fill it with good things. The call of Israel was to position herself to receive, to receive the good things the Lord had for them. This psalm is reminding them of the exodus, of God's deliverance. The implication is, God, do it again. What the Lord is looking for is a people who are willing, a people who will cooperate with his will, a people who will obey his word, a people who will receive from him, who will see themselves in his story. He's looking for a people who will cast their bread upon the water who will go all in, who will say, Lord, here I am. But in the same Psalm, the very next verse is the indictment. 
The Lord had said, open your mouth. I will fill it with good things. But no, my people would not listen. Israel did not want me around. Church, may it not be said of us. May it not be said of GT during this most opportune time when times are refreshing are all around, when revival is in the air, when God is declaring he is doing it again. May we open our mouths and receive the good things of uh, the Lord. May we say, Lord, we want to be in your presence. We need you here in our midst. May we have a cry, a cry that pursues the presence of God, a cry that says, Lord, I'll cast my bread upon the water, a cry that says, Lord, here I am. Fill me, fill me, fill me with the good things of the Spirit of God. Drink, my friends, drink abundantly, beloved, for the river of God has plenty of water for the river of God will never run dry drink beloved drink abundantly my friends for the Lord is here cast your bread upon the water cast your bread upon the water he will fill you with his spirit he will empower you with the Holy Ghost see yourself in the story of God see yourself in the plan of the Lord come now Come now, lift your hands toward heaven. Come now, cast your breath.